I want us to read from God's Word. It's just one verse. John chapter 8, verse 12. John chapter 8, verse 12. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I'll be speaking on the theme, walking in the light. Walking in the light. I want you to remember that this month has been declared as our month of the light. Our light has come. Amen. That is called from Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light is what has come. So today we'll be talking about walking in the light. John chapter 8 verse 12. Jesus said, then he spoke to then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I want my sisters to read with me loud and clear. One, two, go. Then Jesus said, spoke to them say, again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. All of us together want to go. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Father, we thank you for today. We give you praise because the entrance of your word brings light and understanding to the simple. We ask, O oh God, that the light in your word will have a raw encounter with it, with him today in the name of Jesus. Let your word come with the accuracy and with the precision needed in such a way that there shall be healing, there shall be restoration, there shall be breakthroughs, there shall be illumination, there shall be enlightenment, there shall be encouragement, there shall be empowerment, there shall be inspiration in the name of Jesus. Move us from zero to hero in the name of Jesus. Bring us from the backstage of desert even to our palace in the name of Jesus. We ask, O oh God, that the agenda of the enemy flawed for this service and for this moment be permanently destroyed in the name of Jesus and your name shall be glorified. Thank you, everlasting Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may please be seated. Walking in the light. Walking in the light. Without much ado, I want to draw our attention to two pure facts from John chapter 8, verse 12. Two facts from that verse that we have just read. And I want you to please pay attention. The very first fact, this is Jesus speaking to the people, is that Jesus made us to understand from John chapter 8, verse 12, that there are two opposite independent realities that are existing simultaneously. Two opposite independent realities existing simultaneously. If you go back to the Bible text for this month, it says, Arise and shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Now, if you go to verse 2 of Isaiah 60, it says, Darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen in you. Now that tells you that as we are here in this world, we have, we have currently as a reality light and darkness. Amen? Light and what? Light 
and darkness. They are existing concurrently. They are existing, they are happening right now as we speak. And God does not want us to live in any form of a vacuum in our understanding or knowledge. God doesn't want us to be naive. That's why Jesus said in that verse 12, he says that I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Meaning that as Jesus is the light of the world, there is also Satan who is the darkness of the world. And because the devil is not, has not been cast into the bottomless pit, and because the devil has not been thrown into the lake of fire and where he's burning forever and ever, he has not been fully, fully apprehended and isolated. Eternal judgment hasn't kicked in yet. So therefore, we need to be aware that as we live here on earth, there is the light and then there is the darkness. Very, very important. We cannot allow ourselves to be carried away by some of the fantasies that we see out there and, rea and some of the uh, 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 you know, alternative facts and realities that you hear some people talk about when they give their life to Jesus Christ. You know, there was a time in 2010, I remember just now, there was a time I met this uh, this. this, this church leader online in Toronto here. So I met him online, we were chatting, I was quite inclusive, I just came into the country. So I want to know how, what it is like to know how churches, in, how things are settled here, you know, because some of the times you want to study about the history of Christianity and revival about Canada, and um, it can be very, very difficult to find. You know, in UK, in London, in Wales, that was where Charles, uh, that was where people like John Wesley, you know, this great man of God, uh, John Knox, Charles Spurgeon, uh, George Whitfield, these powerful men of God. Or even in the US, where you have Finney, you have Billy Graham. But when you want to study about Canada, <laughs> okay, who do you really point to? And when was the last time, if there was any, a time of revival, when there was an outbreak of revival? I mean, when there was revival in the UK, usually in those days, people, pastors would come, and a preacher would come, pray and preach in a city. And one of the marks of change is that pub houses, pub houses, places where alcohol is sold and all those stuff, they shut down. They don't, they are not, they don't patronize them again. That was what happened. That was what characterized the revival movement in England, in Wales, in Scotland, in Ireland. So when you want to do the same here in Canada, you wonder, oh, what is going on? And when you know that, well, we are just very close to the U.S. With all that is happening in the U.S., you know, the Azusa Street, where the Holy Spirit was poured out about over 100 years ago, and, you know, people were speaking in tongues, the move of God's power, a nation that has produced people like, uh, like uh, John G. Lake, you know, the man John G. Lake. I know I have mentioned him here several times, but in case you don't know, he was a missionary from the U.S. to... Uh, South Africa and in those days they had what you call the bubonic virus in South Africa very very long time ago and when this man got there he got there before the doctors came came from England all right and when he got there he was actually laying hands on those who had the bubonic virus now the bubonic virus is as devastating as that of the Ebola any liquid contact from the person that is infected by the virus within 15 minutes, the person, the other person will get, will get killed. So, but this man without any glove, without any form of medication was touching people, was touching those that were infected. And so the doctors came from, uh, from England and they said, what, doctor, what are you doing here? Uh, evangelist, why are you touching these people? What kind of, you don't need to, you shouldn't do that. That is, you are exposing yourself to sickness and things like that. And uh, John G. Lake looked at them and said, well, but before he said what I'm about to say, they told him that you need to take some of this vaccination to be inoculated. And John G. Lake looked at them and said, you need to take my own vaccination and be inoculated. And so when they saw that he didn't die, he wasn't sick, so they decided to get a sample of his blood, put it under a microscope, injected the bubonic virus, and they were observing that the red blood cells of John G. Lake 
was actually killing the, the virus cells of the bubonic of, 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 of that of, of that bubonic virus. And they were wondering what is going on. That was the kind of person in the US. So I was trying to study what's going on in Canada and then I met this pastor. So I met with him and then we somewhere around Victoria Park, some 10 years ago almost 10 years ago and then we met we were talking and then he said something that really troubled me you know he said to me he was quoting i think zechariah chapter 13 verse 8 where he said that uh, there will be no more witches where the bible was talking of you know that that uh, witches and all those uh, art and all those magic art there will be no more was reciting that portion of the scripture and uh, and he said and he made one mistake he said this is the time that we're in ah and i looked at him i said sir if this is the time that we're in, then have, I don't know if you have moved around the city, the, the, uh, I don't know if you have moved around the town of Scarborough, the city of Scarborough, and you'll have probably seen how many, um, how, many, how many houses, how many shops have palm readers. <laughs> that was in 2010. I was saying, don't you see them around in Scarborough? So if what you are saying is actually true, then those ones shouldn't be here. What am I saying? The, the reality of light and darkness. And we must never be naive because you have all manner of people simulating and conjuring nonsense. Things that, you know, fantasies. You can see, you can see the film of Harry Potter movie and you think that's a joke. No, they are, those wizards, they exist. And because the rapture hasn't taken place, all right, and, and sinners and those who refuse to give their life to Jesus Christ have not been banished to, the, to, to, to eternal, to, to hell, all right, those people, they still exist and we have to be on our guard. And Jesus was saying that he who follows me, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. So walking in the light is a reality and walking in darkness is another reality independent of each other but occurring at the same time. At the same time, at the same time. I have it here that light and darkness cannot tolerate each other. Light and darkness cannot tolerate each other, but they manifest in those that accept them. They do what? They manifest in those that accept them. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I want this passage to be projected and I want you to note this passage of the scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, from verse 4 to 5. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, from verse 4 to 5. It says, But ye brethren are not in darkness. Have me look at your neighbor and say, Hey neighbor, I am not in darkness. I am not in darkness. So let's move on. But ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light. You are what? You are children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, Peter said that, but we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. All right? And he moved on and moved on and he said that we have been called out of darkness into what? Into his marvelous light. So darkness and light, they never meet. They can never tolerate each other. But there is a staggering reality here that both of them are existing simultaneously. But God has told us that we belong to what? To the light. We are not of the darkness. Point number two, from John chapter 8, verse 12. <clears throat> from John chapter 8, verse 12. The point number two is that there is the place for human will, personal determination, and commitment in Christianity. 
And I want you to please follow me carefully. There is the place for human will. Let me say that there is a place to exercise human will. If, I, if I'm to accurately present it as the scripture presents it, as Christ demands us, there is, the, there is a place for the exercise of human will, of personal determination and commitment in Christianity. We became Christians not by compulsion or coercion. We became Christian voluntarily. That's why the Bible says, whosoever. All right? Which time we hear Jesus say, whosoever. All right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, not whosoever is, in fact, no, 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 not that for those who are compelled to. No. Whosoever believes in him shall not what? Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Let me say this, beloved of the Lord, that Christianity involves taking personal responsibilities. Praise the Lord. Christianity involves what? Taking personal responsibilities. Pastor, why are you talking this way? Because Jesus said that he who follows me will not walk in darkness. It is important, Grace Life Chapel, for you to know that you need to you need to exercise, you need to carry out some personal responsibilities that Archangel Michael won't do for you. Gabriel won't do it for you. In fact, as, as gentle, as loving as the Holy Spirit is, it is not within the domain of the Holy Spirit. It lies with us to do what? To take some responsibilities. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Was anybody compelled to come to church today? No. We came because of our own. And that is why every pastor, every genuine pastor is always super excited when he sees people come to the church. Because nobody can force anybody to come to church. No, nobody can. So when there is that response, all right, for when you see people come to the house of the Lord, this defying, the, the you know, they could have gone to work, they could have gone somewhere else, they could have decided not to show up or hook on on, uh, on Instagram and they show up there is joy and the genuine and, this, and, and, the, and the truthful pastor knows that well this can only be the working of the spirit of God and hereby commends even those that are showing up in church that you are responding to the Holy Spirit Christianity involves taking personal responsibilities let me also say that you cannot be coerced into the light. You choose to follow it. You cannot be compelled into the light. You choose to follow it. Jesus said that I am the light of the world. He who follows me, not he who is compelled, not he who is forced. That's why there's no voice of threat here. No, can't threaten anybody. Jesus did not come to threaten anybody. He painted the reality, all right, but there was no form of coercion or forcing anybody or trying to play, make people to feel guilty if they don't follow him. No. The consequences are there, but he never presents it as a threat. You cannot be coerced into the light. You choose to follow it. Then Jesus spoke unto them, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Let me also say that the manifestation of grace in your life happens in conjunction with your consent and acceptance. This is very, very important. We have heard so many blasphemies about grace. And what we think is that we come into autopilot mode when grace is upon us, and we think that, well, we cannot be tempted when you are under grace. That's wrong. The Bible says grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And before Jesus Christ began to cast out demons, before he moved into his ministry, he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights being tempted of the devil. 
So temptation comes. Grace manifests in conjunction with your acceptance and with your consent. God's grace can never be forced on you. That's why in Galatians chapter 2 verse 21, and I want you to note this down, Galatians chapter 2 verse 21, there is perhaps no other apostle or disciple, apostle of God, apostle in the New Testament that ever spoke eloquently about the doctrine of grace other than Paul. No other apostle. He spoke about, if you read the book of Ephesians properly, grace is littered all through that book. All right? He said this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. He says that I do not set aside the grace of God. In the New King James Version, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, yeah, in the New King James Version, he says, I do not set aside the grace of God. All right? For if righteousness comes through the Lord, then Christ died in vain. In another translation, he says that I do not reject the grace of God. So it means that the grace of God can be rejected. I want us to understand, grace of God can be what? Can be rejected. You can hear the gospel and not obey. And not accept it and say, well, this is junk, forget it. It's not for me. There are so many people like that. So two things that I want you to focus on, that I want you to please remember in John chapter 8 verse 12. Two things, very, very important stuff, two, two, two important things in the, in the book of John chapter 8, verse 12, is that two opposite independent realities are existing simultaneously. There's light, there is darkness. And the second one is that, the second one is that there is the place for human will and personal determination and commitment in Christianity. We do not operate Christianity by convenience. That's why you don't see gospel according to saint convenience. No. All right? You have to be determined. I've, I have made up my mind. I'm following Jesus. There is no looking back. <laughs> Goodbye world. I'm staying no longer with you. I have made up my mind. It's a resolution. All right? That I am, I am following Jesus. My commitment is unwavering. All right? I am now in the light. I, don't, I do not associate myself with anything that is in the darkness again. Personal commitment. Personal commitment, a drive that makes you to say, God, it is you are either Lord of all or Lord of none. God cannot have 9.5% of, sorry, 9.5 9 over 10 of your life. No, he wants it everything and he deserves it because he owns you. There is that place of personal determination and commitment in Christianity. And most of the time today, my beloved of the Lord, if I can spend some time on this before I exit to other part of the message, is that we have so much of liberal Christian theology that is infiltrating the church. And folks that are privileged to stand on this side of the auditorium of the of, of, of the church to preach the word of god we are we, we treat it with levity the bible says jesus said that except a seed falls to the ground and dies it abides alone that is there is a level of spiritual consecration there's a level of spiritual commitment that is desired that is desired of you that is expected of you and i in order to make christ to be revealed in us that is why jesus said he who follows me will not walk in darkness he who follows me a personal commitment a personal commitment Jesus got to the lake of Gennesaret and he was and he saw James and James and John the sons of Zebedee and he said to them follow me the Bible said they were with their father all right and 
at the same, when Jesus said it, they dropped their net, left their father, and they followed Jesus. And there's no looking back. Now, one of the things that God will want you to answer in the corridors of your heart, in the recess of your heart this morning, so this afternoon, is this. What is the level of your commitment to Christ? What is the level of your commitment to Christ? Are we playing church or we are actually the church? Am I in Christ or am I still one leg in and one leg out? Do I operate my life based on, well, if it is convenient for me, I will follow Christ. If it is not, I will decline. After all, I've got my mind, it's my life. I can do whatever I like. Well, that's true. It's your life. You can do whatever you like, but there are consequences for every action. Two very, very important things. Human commitment. You need to be committed. You need to show your will. You need to move. God will not do that for you and I. He won't. So, <clears throat> let me move on to this. <clears throat> that, beloved of the Lord, Jesus Christ is the exclusive source of the light. Jesus Christ is who? Is the exclusive source of the light. Is the exclusive source of the light. You see, in the gospel, according to St. John, there are seven I am statements that Jesus Christ made. Seven I am statements. He said it seven times in the whole gospel of St. John. All right? He, he began in John chapter 6 where he said, I am the bread of life. Now, in John chapter 8 that we, said, that, that we just read, that's the second I am statement that he made. He said, I am the light of the world. If you go to John chapter 9, he mentioned the same thing. He said, I am the light of the world. All right? Seven times he said it, I am. I own light exclusively. All right? Which strengthens what he earlier said. He said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. Now, I want you to hold that, that Jesus Christ is the exclusive source of spiritual light. And let us quickly look at what is spiritual darkness. Because what we're talking about is not some physical darkness where there's power failure. No. All right. What is spiritual darkness? Spiritual darkness means deprivation of perceiving and enjoying God. Deprivation of perceiving and enjoying God. The second point is that what is spiritual darkness is living apart from God. Not having fellowship with God through Christ Jesus. So each time we say that I am not in the darkness or I am not in the dark, all right, what we are saying in effect is that I have fellowship with God through Christ Jesus. I interact with him. The Holy Spirit is my lead, is my guide, is my companion, is my comforter, is my paracletos, as it is said in the Greek. We have intimacy. I share a bond with the divinity. The absence or the opposite of light is spiritual darkness, and this is what it is. Deprivation of perceiving and enjoying God. And I want to quickly move to three key indicators of spiritual darkness. Three key indicators of spiritual darkness. And I want you to please follow me because if you know what darkness is, you'll be able to appreciate light and walk in it. Three key indicators of spiritual darkness. And you will see this in the life of atheists and you see this in the life of idol worshippers or those that don't believe in Christ Jesus Christ, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Point number one is that they lack true understanding of God. 
When someone is operating under spiritual darkness, there is no true understanding of God. Hmm. No true understanding of God. In Psalm 14 verse 1, Psalm 14 verse 1, the Bible says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. All right? The fool has said in his heart, what? There is no God. So, for the atheists, and you have them around in a place, in a, in a wonderful place, country like this, where people just don't believe that there's God, all right? It is what? It is as a result of what? Spiritual darkness. The kind of light that you enjoy, all right? Look at the excitement and the drive that propelled you from your bed this morning, made you to defy every form of physical convenience to find your way here today, all right, is because of what? Of the joy of the harmony of the fellowship of the koinonia that you enjoy with the Holy Spirit because you have an understanding, the true understanding of God. Others don't and that marks the difference between you and them. Lack of true understanding of God. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 to 5, in case you ask me, well, Pastor, there are those who, you know, who, who don't, who are atheists yet, but there are those who are unbelievers, sorry, who worship other gods. Don't they have an understanding of God? Well, the kind of understanding that they have is not true, it's not genuine. Because right here, G God told Moses to tell the children of Israel. He says, you shall have no other God before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath. So having a statue of, an, of, a, of, of a beast, of an animal, of any form of being, conjured in any human mind and placing it and bowing down to worship it contradicts true knowledge of God. It is an indication that the individual is operating under spiritual darkness. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, for those who worship, who worship other God except Christ Jesus, all right, they hate God. So you need to understand what we mean when we talk of spiritual darkness. Now, if you go to some, uh, sorry, Isaiah chapter 44, from verse 9 to 20, and we're not going to read all of that, but Isaiah chapter 44, verse 9 to 20, I was going over it, and something popped, out to, popped to my mind. You see, if you read the entire text, that portion of the passage, of, of the scripture, it talks about the life cycle of idolatry. <laughs> the life cycle of idolatry. Isaiah chapter... Isaiah chapter 44, please, from verse 9 to 20. All right, now let me try and talk about what, let me try and move close quickly. He says that those who make an image, all of them are useless, and their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witness. Now, if I move to, if I move to verse 11, he says, surely all his companions will be ashamed and the workmen that are mere men, let them all be gathered together, let them stand up, yet they shall fear, they shall be ashamed together. Now verse 12, very, very important. He says, this is what happens. The blacksmith with the thongs of wax, one in coals, fashions it, hammers it, and it works it with the strength of his arms, even so he is hungry. And his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The craftsman stretches out his rule, marks out, marks one out with chalk, and fashions it with a plane. He marks it out with a compass and makes its figure like a man, according to the beauty of a man. Now, verse 17, verse 14. He cuts down cedars for himself and takes the cypress of oak. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants the pine and on like that. 
And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you find out that the Bible just moves on to say that at the end of the day, after all said and done, these images, whether in wood or in iron, they become burnt in fire. After all said and done, if you read the whole of that passage, so no true understanding of God. People that exchange the knowledge of God for graven images. Those that are under spiritual darkness. And so at times in such a very secular community, such a secular society that we are in in this part of the world, it is important for us to know where we are checking into. We are not expected to participate in every celebration and festival. All right? All in the name of being inclusive. We must understand that. Because we are in the light. We are not in the darkness. And God wants us to be aware of this. Point number two is that for those who walk in the darkness, all right, of spiritual darkness, there is no true understanding of the meaning and purpose of life. No true understanding of the meaning and purpose of life. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 20, Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 20, God was speaking through Moses and these were the final words of Moses. Moses told the children of Israel and by extension everyone under the sound of my voice that the Lord, uppercase L-O-R-D, is your life. Is who is our life in Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 in Revelation chapter 4 verse, verse 11 those majestic beings that are always in the presence of the Lord this is their chant they say thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for your pleasure they are and were created. So somebody who argues about life and living and says, well, it's my life. I get to choose and to do what I, whatever I like, okay? Nobody's going to do this. I'm not going to receive Jesus. They lack a true understanding of the meaning and purpose of life. Of the meaning and purpose of life. Of the meaning and purpose of life. Because if you do understand the meaning and the purpose of life, Romans chapter 14 verse 12, Romans chapter 14 verse 12 will make sense to you, will actually make you to shudder. Paul, writing to the Roman Christians, he said, So then, each of us, I like that word us, it includes church people, will give account of himself to who? To God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10, the Bible says that, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive his due for the things he has done in the body, whether good or bad. Accountability is beckoning for those who choose to walk in the light. Three key indicators. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 to 37. Matthew 12, 36 to 37. Jesus said, But I tell you that, a, that you men will give an account one day on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. So, beloved of the Lord, there is a reason why you are alive. And that is why when we say, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, everything does not end when you sit down. We need to move further. God, what is your plan for my life? You see, sometimes it takes some church people 10 years to ask the question that Paul asked. God, Jesus Christ, the very second that he became blind. What, were the, what was the second question that Paul asked? The first question was, who are you, Lord? Jesus told him, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. The next question Paul will ask is, what do you have me to do? And right there, on the road to Damascus, he keyed into divine agenda. He keyed into the meaning of his life. 
He keyed into purpose. Sometimes it takes 10 years, 15 years for people who come to church, all right, in these days to ask that question. Oh God, what do you want me to do? I've just been coming to church faster. I think I can sing. Maybe I should join to start to sing and the people to sing. No true understanding. No true. This is what I'm asked to do. This is, Pastor, I have a flair for administration. Isn't the way you do things here, yeah, Pastor, the way you visit newcomers, you, and you, you welcome them, you don't do it well enough. And I say, yes, ma'am. Please take over. And you do. Yes. Because there are gifts of administration. Praise the Lord. Very, very important for those. Point number three, the last one, is that there is a life of chaos. Those who walk in darkness, those are marks of spiritual darkness. No true understanding of God, no true understanding of the meaning and purpose of life, and it's a life of chaos. Now you watch something, there's no mention of money there. Because those money, whether you are born again or not, right, you can have money. Money is not a common denominator. No, houses, no. Children, no. All right, so, so, so sometimes when we pray for fruit of the womb or some of this physical material stuff, all right, other people who are not born again, they have them. They have them somehow. All right, and they didn't get it from the devil. Yeah, I mean, the, Hitler had children now, with all these wicked people. They have children, they have money. So what is our differentiator? It is our knowledge and fellowship with God. Our understanding of the purpose of life. All right? I understand that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Eternity with him. That we are not here just for the fun of it. Everything does not end here. And that actually I am time bound. I am actually going to stand before God and actually tell him, account to him, this is how I have spent my life here. And I will actually be rewarded based on that. And I'm actually expected to live by faith and not by sight. That is that when I don't see facts and evidences, support system, infrastructure to make me to go ahead, I do to do your will, I still go ahead and do it. Very, very important. A life of chaos. You see so many people who haven't given their life to Jesus Christ who are up there very successful in the society, and I mean legitimately successful, the hard work, red, all of a sudden, there's depression. All of a sudden, there's suicide. All of a sudden, things just don't work in their home. Children don't get it. And what they have labored for goes into ruin. Life of chaos. That will not be a portion in the name of Jesus. Following the light, therefore, means obedience to Christ. Obedience to Christ and submission to his instructions. Now, I was reading a Bible commentator. He, he was commenting on the word follow. If anyone follows me, anyone that follows me. He was saying that to follow means not to precede. <laughs> and I want you to listen to this. Not to precede. You see, I am not doing my stuff and expecting God to rubber stamp or to approve it. I'm not running ahead of Christ. I'm actually following his lead. You see, I don't run my life by my own agenda or counsel. I run it by him. If he says, don't go, Chris, he's not going. All right? And he says, follow. It means that not when it coincides with your will. Okay, so because I want to do it, I do it. No, not that. Uh, it's not that. It's whether or not, Paul, writing, he said that, be ready in season and out of season to, do, to preach the gospel. Do the work of an evangelist. When it is convenient and when it's not convenient. All right? When things are not encouraging, do it. All right? Walk in the light. Stay committed to Christ. Live a holy life. Exercise righteousness. Exercise spiritual judgment, even when it is unpopular. <laughs> even when it's what? Even when it is unpopular. In the face of persecution, exercise it. We're not saying that you should be bombastic and be loud about it and be outrageous. We're just saying that you should maintain your Christian dignity, your Christian 
practice your Christianity in irrespective of whatever opposition that comes out there. Follow. 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 Now, two benefits of following the light and then we'll pray. Number one is that you have access and fellowship with God. Access and what? And fellowship with God. David said that I would rather be a doorkeeper in your house. All right? than staying 1,000 years in the palace or somewhere else. David said, one thing have I desired, that I will seek the Lord, to look and behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. <laughs> All right? To look and what? And behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. All right? It is then that in the time of storm, he will hide you and protect you in the rock. It is very, very important to know that there is nothing less, there can be nothing compared to having communion with God. Knowing the God that you serve. Elijah said to King Ahab, as the Lord lives, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain in the land of Israel except by my word. Good day, king. And for 42 solid months, there was no dew, there was no rain. And he was beyond the reach of Ahab. Until he himself showed up again and said, yeah, the rain is coming down now. When you know God, access. You see, beloved of the Lord, we are children of God. We cannot behave as if we are servants of God. You see, there's a point where we serve God, yes, but we are children of God. You have access to God as you have access to your biological parents. Interaction. And God wants us to know him at that level, to interact with him at that level, to fellowship with him. Point number two. I have those two here. Point number two, and I want you to take this carefully because here we exit to prayer, is that you are equipped with hope and vision. <laughs> now this is strong. You see, there's one book in the Bible where you have the largest mention of the words darkness and light. That book is the book of Job. About 24 times light is mentioned. 31 times darkness is mentioned in that book. There's no other book that ranks, that moves close to it. Alright? And God directed me to that book and he wants me to read the following scriptures to you. This is Job, a man who experienced darkness to the core. I mean, devil, the prince of darkness, came and devastated his life. In one day, 10 children died. Same day, he lost all his business, all his fortune. He was grounded. All right? Uh -huh. That same day, all right, no, no, the following day, the, the, when the devil came back and went, God said, do you see my servant, Job? There's none like him. He has not even denied me. Satan looked at God and said, God, skin for skin, a man will give all he has for his life. Let me touch him, and he will curse you to your face. Ah. And God said, devil, fine. Go and touch him, but don't have access to his life. He went in and devastated his body with salt. Right from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, there was anguish, there was sore. That his friends heard of his misfortune and they saw Job from afar and they were weeping. The Bible said for seven solid days, they just sat around Job and they were mute. They couldn't console him. They were so devastated by the level of darkness, <laughs> by the level of atrocity that the prince of darkness has performed in his life. To take it to the next level, his wife said, won't you curse God and die? Ha. Isn't that one of the signs of darkness? No true understanding of God. So, that man Job, he has the following words for you, Grace Life. In Job 14, verse 7. Job 14, verse 7, in the depth of darkness, Job said, For there is hope for a tree, if it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and the tender shouts will not cease. Verse 14, Job speaking. He said, if a man dies, 
shall he live again all the days of my hard service I will wait until my change comes I'm repeating it go and check if you read the old King James version there is no portion of the book in the 30 in the in the books of the Bible where you have mentioned darkness and light more go and check it all right so he was speaking from as someone who has received darkness and light who understand what both means now listen to this in job 19 verse 25 to 26 job 19 25 to 26 he says for i know my redeemer liveth and he shall stand at last on the earth i love verse 26 he says after my skin is destroyed this I know that in my flesh not in my spirit you see flesh will not where we get to heaven flesh can't go there it's corrupted he said in my flesh I shall see God that is I am going to make it back I'm going to recover from loss this is not the end of my life it doesn't end here as someone who is lighted you see he did not permit himself to commit suicide he did not allow himself personal commitment he did not allow himself to deny God he was not absent one day from church with every legitimate excuse that he had to move away from Jehovah he said no I said in this flesh as devastated as this flesh is, as this skin is, I will see him. I will see, not after he has recovered. Right there in the midst of the misery unleashed on him by darkness, he said, I will see God. That's why I know that it is not over for you. That's why I know that that's, this is not where it ends. All right? You are going higher. I say you are going higher irrespective of every error in the past my God is able to straighten it he's able to do what he's able to straighten it and whether you have enough faith to receive this or not I say this with all boldness he has the ability to absorb you from the consequences of past errors amen. your amen is very weak amen. but I don't care my God is able to do what? To absorb you from, if he did it for Jonah. And Jonah is not a fiction. He's an actual Bible character and it happened. And Jesus Christ, when he came, he referred to Jonah. Then there, and Jonah was operating under a far inferior covenant than you. Then it means that there is no past mistakes that you have truly repented of. That my God cannot absorb you of the consequences of. Rise on your feet.